Imagine waking up one morning to discover that the internet, as we know it, is on the brink of collapse, all because of a single virus spreading like wildfire. This actually happened, and the unlikely hero who saved the day wasn't a government agency or a cybersecurity giant, it was a young hacker. Today, we're diving into the incredible true story of how one hacker, against all odds, managed to stop a global disaster and save the internet. After a week of non-stop partying, Marcus Hutchins awoke on a peaceful August morning in 2017 and packed up his Las Vegas Airbnb. The young British hacker, who is 6 feet 4 inches tall and has wild blonde brown hair, was in town for DEF CON, the biggest hacking convention in the world. He picked up his Uber Eats delivery, barefoot and untidy, hardly noticing a black SUV parked close. He briefly went into paranoia, wondering if the FBI was conducting a stakeout, but he soon dismissed the thought. After taking legal cannabis in Nevada, Hutchins returned inside, ate his burger and started packing, feeling tired and drowsy. Just three months before, he had stumbled onto a kill button for the WannaCry ransomware, which had halted the worldwide strike. He was working from his home in rural England at the time. Because of this courageous deed, he became a superstar at DEF CON. Hutchins, who was still slightly impaired, took an Uber to the airport without realizing that the black SUV was following closely behind. He was asked to remove all three of his laptops by TSA inspectors at security, which is quite rare especially for a hacker like him. Overwhelmed by exhaustion, he snatched a coke and lingered in the lounge, blissfully unaware that the authorities had been observing him for days. Hutchins lounged on an armchair, tweeting to kill time. Joking about not touching a debugger in more than a month, he expressed his delight about returning to work and analyzing malware following his time away. He tweeted a message from a fan praising his reverse engineering abilities after posting a modest brag about the expensive shoes his boss had purchased him in Vegas. For Hutchins, it was simply another day in the life of a hacker turned unannounced hero. Then, three guys approached him while he was writing another tweet. Two customs and border protection uniform-wearing policemen flanked the big man with a red beard. Someone in CBP uniform approached me and asked me my name. The man with the red beard questioned, Are you Marcus Hutchins? Hutchins nodded to affirm his identification. Without any drama, the man gently invited him to accompany them through a door into a private stairway. The men had Hutchins in handcuffs before he completely understood what was happening. Now under custody was the young hacker who had recently prevented a large-scale cyber attack from destroying the planet. The cybersecurity community was rocked by Hutchins' unannounced arrest. Well before he became well-known globally for stopping WannaCry, the FBI had charged him with developing and spreading malware in his former days as a hacker. Unquestionably, the irony was that the man who had preserved the internet was now being accused of having once helped to create its vulnerabilities. Marcus Hutchins was dazed and seated in an interrogation room, trying to make sense of what was happening. It all felt unreal, as though he was watching his own life from far away. Seeking explanations, he asked the agents, What's going on? The red-haired man who had guided him there responded vaguely, We'll get to that. Marcus sat there as ideas flew across his head. Customs might possibly be interested in what? He went back mentally over every dubious action he had ever taken. Surely it had nothing to do with the ancient, unmentionable crime he had committed years ago. Perhaps it was something simpler. Perhaps marijuana remained in his suitcase and the authorities were overreacting over petty narcotics possession. Moments later, the agents guided him across a monitor-lined security section and then seated him in the questioning room. Once more alone, Marcus's anxiousness grew. The red-haired agent came back, followed by a petite blonde woman. Both of them flaunted their FBI agent badges. This was no longer only a matter of customs. The agents asked Marcus about his education and employment at Crypto's Logic, the cybersecurity company where he examined malware, first in a laid-back, friendly manner. Marcus dared to dream for a few minutes that this was all about his heroic deed of neutralizing the WannaCry infection, which had made him well-known among hackers. Maybe the FBI simply needed his assistance with the probe of that historic worldwide cyber attack. But the tone changed approximately 11 minutes into the conversation. Marcus was startled to hear the agents utter the word Kronos. Marcus had a chilly surge of insight. Kronos, he said in a whisper. That name is known to me. Gradually, he realized this had nothing to do with WannaCry. Kronos was another completely different tragic chapter from his past. Marcus realized then he wasn't going home 
anytime soon. We must rewind 14 years to Marcus Hutchins' early years to grasp the meaning of this occasion. Long before he was hailed as a hero, or accused as a villain, his parents Janet and Desmond relocated a family to a stone home on a cattle farm in Devon, England. Janet, a Scottish nurse, and Desmond, a Jamaican social worker, intended to raise their two boys, Marcus, and his younger brother in an area remote from the bustle and diversions of London. Two sons would have found the property to be perfect. Their days were spent building tree houses and improvised trebuchets, playing among the cows and touring the fields. Marcus, a bright and thoughtful youngster, felt strongly about right and wrong. Desperate, his father, Desmond, said he was stoic and self-reliant without expressing feelings. Marcus fractured his wrist, for instance, and he did not weep. But the lad was inconsolable when the owner of the farm had to turn down a calf Marcus had bonded with. Marcus often felt as though he didn't really fit in, even in the quiet surroundings of the farm. He preferred surfing in the frigid waves close to the coast, taller than his friends and showed little passion for soccer, a preoccupation for most English lads. Being one of the few mixed-race children in the neighborhood, his refusal to cut his wild, curly hair simply made him stick out more. Marcus stood out, though, because of his fixation on technology. Marcus had been enthralled with the family's old Windows 95 PC from six years ago. He was disassembling the computer to learn how it ran and experimenting with unusual applications while other children were playing outdoors. Marcus had started learning to code when the family relocated to Devon. Originally created basic Hello World applications, he quickly discovered that programming presented almost endless opportunities. It was a tool that let him design any he could see, far more fascinating than building forts with his brother. Marcus, nevertheless, considered the computer courses at school to be excruciatingly dull. Marcus was already far more sophisticated while his peers were still learning to run word processors. Not helpful either were the school's limited computers. The network's firewalls limited access to several websites, and he could install the games he wanted to play, Counter-Strike or Call of Duty. Marcus, nevertheless, soon discovered means of grounding these restrictions. He could install unapproved programs and write Visual Basic Code in Microsoft Word using its built-in scripting tool. He even worked out how to visit any website he wanted by bouncing his web traffic across a proxy server, therefore escaping the school's internet sensors. Marcus's parents had last yielded to his requests for his own computer on his 13th birthday. Instead of acquiring a pre-built machine, they bought the various parts he needed so Marcus could build a computer himself. Computers soon took the front stage in his life. Later on, his mother claimed that his passion for computers was so strong, it dominated practically all aspects of his life. Although Marcus Hutchins was a great surfer and swimmer, technology was his real calling. He was hooked to his computer, either learning programming or gaming while he was not in the water. Janet, his mother, worried about his growing online fixation and about its darker sides. Marcus always discovered methods to get beyond her attempts to create limits, including parental controls and limited internet access, usually outplaying her with his technological ability. They came to a truce finally, but Janet knew she had no way of keeping an eye on her son's online behavior. Marcus had began investigating hacking sites by the time he had his own computer. One early impact was an MSN forum where hackers shared worms, malware that proliferated instant messaging. Enthralled by the opportunities, Marcus developed a basic password stealer to access login data kept by Internet Explorer using decryption. Though Marcus saw this early effort as more of a technical accomplishment rather than sinister, his colleagues approved it. Marcus's academic life suffered, even if his hacking ability grew. Often skipping school entirely, he would spend late programming and seldom sleep. He was suspended at 15 after allegedly hacking the school's network. He rejects this charge even now. Marcus moved to Hack Forums, a community with more advanced and ethically dubious hackers about this time. Starting Ghost Hosting, a company offering web hosting for illicit websites, he created a botnet compromising more than 8,000 compromised computers. Marcus defended his conduct by downplaying the seriousness of his operations, concentrating instead on improving his virus, even if he drew the line on several crimes, including bank fraud. Eventually, he turned away from botnets and hosting to concentrate on developing advanced malware, even making money for his efforts from other hackers. Marcus's engagement in the cyber underworld intensified as he kept improving his technological abilities. 
At the time, he did not quite understand the gravity of his activities. Another member commissioned Hutchins to design an anti-antivirus solution when he demonstrated his developing programming abilities on hack forums. For his effort, Hutchins got $200 in Liberty Reserve. This resulted in a follow-up request for a form grabber, a rootkit able to pilfer private data from online forums. Hutchins made $800 for this, which enhanced his image as a competent malware copywriter. A more serious client, Vinny, approached Hutchins at 16 and made a profitable offer. Hutchins would get half of the sales from each complex rootkit they created. Unlike the usual hackers Hutchins had been across, Vinny was professional. The two worked closely but behind anonymity to guarantee they left no evidence of their contacts. Hutchins trusted Vinny, even revealing personal information with him a choice he would later regret. Hutchins worked on UPAS kit for nine months, which finally sold well on darknet markets such as Darkode and Exploit, and therefore generating Hutchins with first notable income. He bought fancy goods, upgraded his PC, and even experimented with Bitcoin trading. When Vinny insisted on a sequel, Hutchins grew uncomfortable when asked to include capabilities like web injects used to commit bank fraud. Refusing, Hutchins understood the moral and legal ramifications. But Vinny said he had recruited someone else to finish the web injects, therefore negating Hutchins' rejection. Trapped and enraged, Hutchins came to see he had crossed a boundary and there was no turning back. Using amphetamines to drive his coding sessions, Hutchins descended into anxiety and addiction. Living a quiet existence, his only friends were the glow of his computer screen and his biting fear of being discovered. Seeing the human cost of his activities via internet forums made him even more internally conflicted. Hutchins quit cold turkey, desperate to fear off this sinister road. The withdrawal was terrible, sending him into paranoia and sadness. Still, a sliver of optimism showed up. Starting a blog called Malware Tech, he anonymously shared his knowledge of malware analysis. This blog drew a devoted readership even if Hutchins' past remained a secret. Then arrived WannaCry, a horrible ransomware worm wreaking havoc on governments, companies and hospitals all across. Now, a security researcher, Hutchins observed something unusual in the coding of the virus as the attack was underway. It appeared to be investigating a certain online address. On a whim, Hutchins registered with a meaningless web domain for a meager $10.69. The next event was just amazing. Designed to check that address before causing havoc, WannaCry abruptly came to a stop. Former cybercrime victim Hutchins had unintentionally turned into an unintentional hero. He had identified the kill switch of the malware, not its control center. His basic deed of registering a domain name has virtually stopped a worldwide epidemic. Hutchins felt the weight of this insight very strongly. He sprang with delight, then, in an uncommon action, went upstairs to show his family his amazing achievement. The press picked up Hutchins' tale at the time. His well-kept obscurity was broken and he was suddenly in the public eye. Interviews, unwelcome attention, and a persistent worry that a new WannaCry variant may surface inundated him. At last, following a week of unrelenting effort, the worst of the threat vanished. Extired but praised as a hero, Hutchins let himself have a small celebration. But his increased notoriety came with a price. Legal problems loomed big, ready to destroy his recently acquired way of life. Hutchins was detained by the FBI for his contacts with Kronos on his last day in Las Vegas. Flying back to the US, he was kept in solitary prison and confronted with an uncertain future. Still, the hacking community banded around him. Raising money for his bail and legal defense, friends and supporters banded together. Though he was released from prison, he stayed under home arrest and carried a terrible weight of guilt. Hutchins felt like an imposter, even with all of the love. He battled remorse, sadness, and the want to own his previous mistakes. After almost a year and a half of legal fighting, Hutchins at last agreed a plea deal. Negotiations with prosecutors proved contentious. He admitted his sins and delivered a public confession, therefore debunking the idea that his past crimes were a necessary prelude to his heroics. He admitted two charges. Judge Stadtmuller shocked everyone that day of sentence. He saw Hutchins' potential for a good as well as the particular situation of the case. The judge sentenced Hutchins to time served with probation instead of a severe sentence noting his bravery. Marcus Hutchins' story is a testament to the power of redemption. 
It highlights the complexities of human nature and the possibility of turning away from a dark path. Today, Hutchins continues to use his talents for good, working to protect the internet from future threats. The life of Marcus Hutchins is evidence of the strength of atonement. It emphasizes the complexity of human nature and the opportunity to veer from a terrible road. Hutchins still uses his skills for good now, trying to guard the internet against upcoming dangers. If you found this story as mind-blowing as we did, don't forget to hit the like button and share it with your friends. And if you want to hear more amazing stories like this one, make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you never miss out. Thanks for watching and stay curious.